Hi, this is Phil Shapiro. I have been reading a really interesting book, Who Owns the Learning by Alan November. I came across this book because I heard about the conference that he organizes every summer called Building Learning Communities. So he's been doing that for 17 years, organizing this conference called Building Learning Communities. What a wonderful name for a conference. So he, um, here is some information about him from the book. Uh, he's an internationally recognized educator. Um, I love his TED Talks. You got to go see some of his TED Talks. Very personable and thoughtful and amusing and uh, kind of the teacher that you would hope your child would have in school. So um, here in the introduction of the book, he tells a really interesting story about in the early 80s when computers were just coming into schools. One of, his, one of his students at a school named Gary broke into the school on a weekend uh, and he broke in to use the computers, but the school thought that he was maybe there to vandalize the computers. So they sent Alan November down there to discipline him and Alan found out that he wasn't there to vandalize, he was there to teach himself some computer programming. So Alan saw the learning opportunity there and invited him to uh, take a computer programming class or course over the summer. And then the student, Gary, said, I, I don't have free time, I have a summer job, but if you lend me the computer, I'll take it home over the summer, over the weekend, and I'll do the whole summer class, uh, all the assignments in one weekend. And so Alan November took this risk and the student came through with flying colors apparently. So what an interesting story. Um, um, here's another story um, where he says, um, why the digital learning farm? So here he's talking, uh, I have this quote here, the power and purpose of meaningful contribution has been missing from our classrooms and our youth culture for some time. While life outside of schools has changed dramatically over the past century, we cling to an early industrial and classroom model that often fails to encourage collaboration, innovation, a global work ethic, or critical problem solvings. Our students are caught in a process we call cover the curriculum regardless of their mastery of the materials. So what an interesting quote. I couldn't help but uh, bring that into this book review. So. Um, Here's another story that's really interesting that's featured in one of his TED Talks. So it's the barbershop story where there was a there was a abandoned barbershop that Alan November ended up renting for a dollar. Uh, he, he bid, he, there was an auction because this building was going to be dis demolished, but until it was demolished there was um, an auction for some temporary usage of the building, building and Alan November bid a dollar and won the bid and then he, he uses this barbershop for all sorts of really interesting community health projects uh, involving students where the students are leaders in improving community health and community information about health and all sorts of neat stuff. Um, check out this, uh, I love this TED talk. This is Alan November, uh, March 2011. Uh, when I was watching this, I chortled exuberantly. I mean, this is really interesting TED Talk. Go see it and come back when you're done. Um, speaking of barbershops, uh, there's a, I love any, any story having to do with barbershops and learning is bound to be interesting. So uh, I read a biography of Walt Disney right here in our own library where I work. And there was a barbershop story there with Walt Disney and I um, summarized it put it up onto the web, it's in English and Spanish, and I found a narrator. So go take a look at this. You can search YouTube, it's called Walt Disney's Barber 720p, uh, that's 720, that's the video resolution, uh, in English and Spanish. So, and this is public domain, I'm, I'm donating this to the public domain. So, um, whoop, I gotta plug this in here, got a little speaker. Um, so then he, he goes on and he talks about his own son, Dan, uh, Alan November's son, Dan, um, and the difference between his, his school uh, activity and his home activity. So at home, 
He chooses his applications and easily moves from one to the other. He's self-taught, self-directed, highly motivated. That kind of stuff doesn't happen at school. So Alan's saying, listen, we've got to harness this enthusiasm students have for using digital tools. And instead of prohibiting stuff, we should be, um, we should be encouraging it. Uh, another really interesting story. So Alan November is talking about this uh, educator over in California, Eric Marcos, who had a sixth grade student, Jasmine, who was building tutorials and her mom came to pick her up from after school and Jasmine said, I need an extra hour. I'm, I'm building learning materials for my, my uh, other students in the class. And the, and the uh, Jasmine mother was just uh, so confused, like, What's, why, is my, why is my daughter so interested in learning because the daughter had become a teacher? So that's really interesting. The student as tutorial designer. Uh, this is interesting and amusing. So Alan November talks about uh, screencasting kind of tools and he mentions that you can use any kind of painting program to create graphics. On Windows you can create, uh, use uh, paint. Uh, Tux Paint is this really fun program for young kids. It's for Linux or Mac or Windows. And then he mentions Mac Paint. And Mac Paint was really popular on Macintoshes in the 1980s on the black and white Macs, but it really hasn't been used in the last 20 or 30 years. And I thought it was pretty amusing that uh, it got mentioned in this book. But um, anyway, one thing I was kind of surprised in this book is there's not that much talk about open source software or Linux and stuff like that. And I see a real parallel between Ellen November's book and this fellow over in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Charlie Reisinger in the Penn Manor School District. And he gave a TED Talk that's really kind of parallel with a lot of the ideas in this book. I've, uh, I've taken his TED Talk, which is about 17 minutes long, and I've assembled just like three and a half minutes, which I think I'd, uh, I'm going to show right here. Uh, I'm using LibreOffice. So let's take a peek and a listen to Charlie and see how similar you can compare and contrast this stuff. You see, though, our knowledge is born from our experiences. The process of deconstruction and reconstruction, it's intensely powerful. Building things is how we learn. Yet schools commonly restrict students and prevent this type of experimentation. They prevent kids from lifting the lid on their computers, or they give them a laptop or a tablet that's locked down, or only running the software that a school administrator says should run. The building blocks of technology, coding and programming, they're literally locked under glass. And this draconian practice, it stifles our students' creativity, their ability to explore and learn through software, to tinker and modify their computers. Imagine a NASCAR driver who didn't have the ability to tune or modify the engine on her race car. Without the ability to tune or modify their school computers, our students are simply riders on a programmer's virtual bus. We decided early on in our program that we wanted our kids to be innovators and inventors and not technology tourists. Here's where we broke from tradition. Every one of our 1,700 high school students has an administrator account on their laptops. They're root, and they're free to install software, change up the operating system, reconfigure their laptops. My team and I encourage them to code or to run little mini web servers on their school technology or even install learning games. We brought all of our students together at the beginning of this project for a class meeting and we explained this open philosophy to them. And we started the conversations with the words, we trust you. We broke the software locks. We honored their inquisitive nature and their thirst for discovery. And we empowered them to go forth and build something amazing with their school technology. And with that, we arrive at the secret behind our program's success. That's our student technology apprenticeship program. At the beginning of the academic year, we launched our program with a small pilot of about 90 students, juniors and seniors, that receive laptops ahead of the full student body. And at the time, we also spun up a peer support help desk program. What better way for our kids to learn the art and the science of computing than through an apprenticeship 
side by side with my IT team and I. Now the apprenticeship program, the Tech Support Help Desk, this is actually a course, it's a class that appears on the student schedules. And they show up for class just like they would a math or an English class. But it's so much more than that. We trust our student apprentices implicitly and treat them as true IT team equals. And these remarkable kids have earned truckloads of respect from my team and I. Many of them have volunteered over 400 hours of their own time, working side by side with my staff and I. Much of this has been occurring over the summer for the past several years. For our one-to-one -one program on day one, our tremendous apprentices were right beside us, not only providing peer support to their fellow students, but also helping us to configure and fine-tune our laptops as we ramped up to the full program launch. So the back page of the book, there's a, um, a testimonial from Eric Mazur at Harvard, and he himself is a really incredible physics teacher who's re-architecting how college is taught. He's got the flipped classroom model, and um, so he says, this book will change the way you think about the process of learning. Uh, go look up Eric Mazur's TED Talks. They are, uh, I think there's more than one of them, and they are really spellbinding. Uh, and you can also, uh, Eric Mazur uh, has been interviewed or covered by NPR here. Physicist seeks to lose the lecture as a teaching tool. Um, here's Alan November on Twitter. He is global learner with one L in the middle, global learner. And one thing about this book that's kind of interesting, it's not a long book. It's, um, I think it's 88 pages or 89 pages. Uh, it just goes to show you sometimes powerful things get packaged in small little bundles. Uh, this is a really interesting and important book. It's not a long book, but I would say it's really worthwhile for teachers, school principals, school, school superintendents, anybody else who cares about learning. Who Owns the Learning by Alan November.